So we need another another part of the, the crew, an essential part of the crew, Alex. <laughs> the PA. Coffee break, I <laughs> wish, I wish. Alex is a very important part of the crew because she was liaison <coughs> for everybody. She keep the technical notes or the, the notes on the filming and the shot lists, but she'd all also provide us with uh, looking for the hotels, uh, provide us with tea at the tea breaks in the most extraordinary places and look after the comforts of all when you're in, uh, on, in arduous conditions. It took me, time, I think, time to realise just how much is going on behind the scenes I mean, they were often working long after we'd wrapped. They'd be sitting at, uh, in the, in the well, hotel. Rescheduling mainly. Typing yes. out shot lists. Yes. Uh, endless typing yes. out of shot lists. All being done in the hotel after we'd gone off for our meal and were, were relaxing. But generally their job was to just look after everything. Us, the director, um, the catering, the hotel bookings, everything. It, it was a pretty impressive job. And the best did it incredibly well without even noticing. They were like proverbial swan or serene on the surface and absolutely paddling, like, paddling like mad underneath. The first thing is really this shot list is a, is a huge concern because one of the things in those days, we used to go away for very long periods of time, sometimes six week locations, and we'd have to ring home to find out about the rushes and we'd have this dreaded note from the man back who'd just seen them saying, roll 22, shot, whatever it was, no good. And we might have left the location, we might have been far away, and we had to hunt in my little book for where it was, and then we had to decide whether or not we were going back. It was a constant challenge getting the rushes back. Um, yes. we, we tried to get rushes off every night, wherever we were, and that could be in, in the middle of nowhere. I mean. And it was never done locally. I mean, we were filming in Hong Kong, but we were sending rushes back every night by, by plane. And more often than not, it was the poor old assistant's job to take the rushes to the airport. So he'd be working long after everybody else. Sometimes the PA went to the airport with the rushes. And then, as, as Alex says, the next morning, it's the dreaded phone call. And, and even sending from Hong Kong, you get a rushy report the next morning um, because it would be processed overnight and our film operations manager would view the rushes first thing in the morning and have a report ready for us. It was pretty impressive, actually, the turnaround. But uh, it was still 24 hours too late if something had gone wrong. Not like today, where you can play it back instantly and say, oh, better do that again. We didn't do that. One of the things that the PA often had to handle, often going off to make the phone call yes. and coming back, you could tell she's coming back, see what her face looks like, and <laughs> she's going, and equally, there weren't phones all over the place. You weren't um, going only, no mobiles. Some of the hotels were just had sort of one shaky old phone in the lobby. No telex. Had to go to the local post office to find the telegram. Yes, the communications were... Well, very minimal. That's where the cameraman would the really much talk to me because he couldn't tell the director what a lousy schedule it was. This happened a lot, I mean, I say it happened a lot. If there was some sort of confrontation of that type, mm. problems with schedule, problem with mm. being booked into dreadful mm. hotels, mm. the kind of thing that got a crew mm. pretty angry, mm. it was usually the first protocol was mm. the PA. Before you went to the director or the producer, it was always, I talk to the PA. In those days, we had quite a strict structure of the day. And in fact, I think, if I remember rightly, 10 o'clock till 5 p.m., 10 till 1700, was the working day. And anything outside those hours was overtime. Weekends, bank holidays, all overtime. And if you missed a meal because you've been driving about six hours and you haven't seen a cafe, it was a penalty, a penalty meal. So that all that was money on the budget. A lot of memory of trying to keep lunches, all jolly, where well, you have a break, you have a nice time, you've found a super restaurant, you, well, everybody's having a nice time and you're thinking, hmm, it's nearly an hour, it's nearly, I mean, we've got to get going. We cannot be sitting round here having a nice lunch. We've got to get on. So it was me who sort of, because the director can't be seen to be, oh, come on now, you know. It was me who had to say, come on. Yes, and you, we would use you as the go-between. And, and well, that, that was very... Shamelessly. And, and that, yeah. funnily enough, I'd forgotten how bossy I was in those days. <laughs> My uh, mother said to me when I went home, I'm not your crew, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't boss me. But, of course, that was part of it, wasn't it? We had to boss a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Mm. It was a penalty for a totally missed meal. That would be a no-lunch break, an NLB. It went in the diary, NLB. 
Uh, it yes. will be a short break, which is less than an hour. That's um, oh, less yeah, LB, that's short another, lunch break. another penalty, less than an hour. And you knew damn and, well uh, you had to go from another million miles in the car. No, uh, no suitable food. We love that suitable <laughs> word because we could apply it to anything. It wouldn't just, not just, it's cold, we're not, it's not a problem. If it was, food was, was unedible or for some reason, you, I don't know, you're in the souk in, in Cairo or something, um, then it was that, that would be a, um, a penalty payment as well. So it was a very complex system. Late lunch break, that was the other one. Anything, anything more than five hours since the last break was a penalty. And uh, I mean, it sounds bizarre now because people put up with so much uh, today This is this dreaded typewriter Bring for the on. famous um, shot lists, which actually a lot of girls, as you said, a lot of girls would do this in the evening back in the hotel. They'd type up their shot list. Also, of course, any change of schedule, that's another reason you'd need a typewriter. And also, in, in our, the cases I work, a lot of the times I worked with uh, front men, as we call it, and I basically was... Um, Typing up the sink pieces to camera. Oh, I can't even get the thing open. <laughs> You're like me with a camera earlier on. I don't know, I remember how to open it. The thing is that this uh, this shot list business is quite a fuss because you've only got to go away to um, talk to a contributor, to arrange for the next location, to do this, to do that, and they've done about twenty odd shots. And you you know you can you can not, and you can never disturb. You can't disturb the cameraman but I used to disturb the assistant cameraman yeah. and he'd help me so always make friends with the assistant cameraman. Yes quite. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right he'd always open your typewriter for you. Thank you very much and also catching up with what you might have missed because he'd have a log of all the roles. The roles only lasted 10 minutes. Um, you've only got to have somebody talking away as I've been doing. <laughs> you've, got to, uh, you're, you've got another role gone by. I had the stopwatch, but um, uh, in documentaries, and the, uh, a lot of the time, I wasn't always putting the watch on every second, obviously, for all the general shots. And, and, and often I didn't know what the shot was. I didn't dare look through the lens every moment, did I? I mean, you were all busy. Always welcome to look through mine. <laughs> but then today, and I still don't know how this works, they don't have a PA at all and they go back into the, the cutting room with 4,000 yeah. hours oh, of a, for a half hour documentary. How on earth they sort it out, I have no idea. There must be, somebody here can probably tell me, but I don't know how it works. I don't know how you work without awful. having no. proper records no. of what you're doing it's on awful. location. Then they called us sweetie girls, didn't they? Which of course, I'd never minded being, uh, offering you a peppermint. Well, that well, was part, very part welcome. of the, yeah, <laughs> buying the sweeties, yeah. <laughs> Oh uh, dear, no, and, and also bringing the icebox along, didn't I? I always had a icebox, especially when you're filming in the desert, for goodness sake, you have an icebox and you jolly well, you know, get, get it filled up every day and, and every morning in the hotel you'd fill it up with water or whatever. And, Bring it up well, you know, it was quite a, you're miles away from anywhere a lot of times, so there we are. What else? Money belt, look at that, that's oh, wow. a, very crucial not to lose the money or have it stolen or... Again, working in masses of different currencies, and you're not familiar with the notes, and you're always doing things slightly in the dark at the end of the day, and then maybe in some cafe, and having to pay your lighting men or, or whoever, whoever, and there you are in a fuss. I can remember when we were in um, Cairo, we took the night train to Luxor, and we, the train was to arrive at four o'clock in the morning, and we were all awake all night, you know, to list, wait for four o'clock in the morning. Come four o'clock, we all, train stops, we all to get out. No platform. All the gear had to be manhandled down onto the track. And at four o'clock in the morning, there was not a taxi to be seen. So we had to hire donkeys. <laughs> you imagine lifting all this gear, however many ex I mean, we're talking about however many, oh, goodness gracious, the weight alone, the poor donkeys. But at four in the morning, we were lucky to find a donkey. Yes, absolutely. Well, first role was looking after the cameraman, actually. <laughs> But then, as long as he was happy, she could start concentrating on everybody else. Contributors. <laughs> the now, obviously, the assistant could feed his woes through her to the cameraman, in fact. PA was also often the butt of jokes, uh, with a certain amount of sort of casual sexism, probably. Yes. A lot of uh, the kind of thing that would have a feminist storming off these days. Um, they had to put up with mm. a lot of sort of 
nudge, nudge mm. sort I, of humour. Yes, I mean, you know, damn it. But um, well, we, we, in those days, we were not quite so. But it worked the other way too, because it meant because there was a, a woman on location with us. It tempered our conversation quite a bit. Mm. If you're out and having a few drinks in the evening, it had never got too smutty. <laughs> because in those days, you thought you mustn't get too smutty in front of a woman. It wouldn't bother about anybody these days, but in those days, it was kind of important. So they were a restraining influence on, on, on us sometimes.